today uh, the wonderful grant that the Society and the Jack Hadley Black History Memorial Collection has received from the Georgia Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities to the amount of $4,000 to help fund this project. And the project has three main components, and today you are taking part in one of those. The first component was the collection of oral histories from some 15 elderly individuals who lived and worked and played on the southern hunting plantations in the first half of this century. And uh, Jack Hadley has collected all those histories. They will be bound and provided to the public through the public library and the museums. Uh, in addition, they, um, these histories have been videotaped and audio taped, and these also will be available and, and held for historical purposes. The second part of our project is the collection and production, collection of photographs and production of an exhibit that chronicles and illustrates much of the rich history of these individuals who worked on the Southern Hunting Plantation. And over here on your right is the main results of this exhibit project. So that's the second item in our grant. The third item is a presentation today of a program to the public in which we have a scholarly presentation uh, addressing the history of this era at the turn of the century, and secondly, presenting a panel discussion of the, uh, of the histories and re remembrances of some of these individuals who have uh, participated in the uh, southern hunting plantation over the years. So we, we thank you for coming. We will have two phases to this afternoon. First will be the presentation of the, uh, the historical information, we will then take a break and give you all about 30 minutes to, uh, to tour the museum, to look at the exhibits, to take part in some refreshments, and to get acquainted. And we will uh, reassemble about 4 o'clock and begin the second part, which will be the panel discussion. Um, I, I ask that, uh, if possible, that you register as a guest today. Many of you already have. There will be a clipboard and an opportunity for you if you haven't during the program to, uh, to register, so we encourage you to do that. Again, thank you for coming, and I think that uh, you will have a, a wonderful afternoon that I certainly look forward to. Our guest speaker this afternoon is Professor Titus Brown from the History Department at Florida A&M University. Uh, Professor Brown received his undergraduate training at Albany State College and has been with the um, Florida A&M University for about two years and is also associated with the Black Archives and Research Center there. And it's with pleasure and with honor that we welcome Professor Brown. Good afternoon uh, to the Thomas County leadership, uh, citizen of the communities. Uh, the committee, Dr. Sis, Mr. Hadley, who aided in the development of this project, and to a uh, key few individuals in the audience and some on the platform. Uh, Dr. Hey, hey. Uh, I need to pay special tribute to a couple of key individuals out in the audience, and of course, behind me here. Uh, Dr. Lee W. Formwood, who aided me in the formative stage of my development as a, as a historian. Um, Professor James E. Tarn at Florida a m who aided me in my development as an archivist. Um, and Dr. William Warren Rogers, who taught most of the courses that I've had on Southern history. Uh, to attempt in such a brief period to look at the South and the development of the South over the years, and what has transpired with African America is very difficult to look at and assess at this point. Uh, however, we will look at a glance at some of the uh, major themes in Southern history at this particular point. Once white Southerners regained full political power in their states in the 1870s, even the few outward trappings of black power disappeared or began to rescind. Northerners increasingly contented themselves with self-congratulations over ending slavery and restoring the Union, while ignoring or depreciating the economic political problems of the freedom. 
conservative white redeemers in the South drew closer to their northern counterparts while rebuilding a strong Democratic Party in the region. And as the Grant era grew to a close, the new uh, Negro question became silent in the South and seemed safely pigeonholed as a matter for local authorities to handle. Southern blacks and a tiny band of northern white sympathizers knew quite well what redemption meant for the Negro. Penis and freedom replaced penis and slavery for most blacks. Desperately, thousands sought means to escape his ordination, which whites at home and in Washington had designed for them. A few years later, when the 20th century began, there was just cause for despair among the small black bourgeoisie, as well as among the dead ridden black peasantry. Nevertheless, black spokesmen sought formula uh, accommodation that would deflect an impact of white racism and offer some real hope for the future. Booker T. Washington offered the dominant formula one which seemed eminently practical to most whites, acquiescence and segregation and political disbarment. Coupled with slow rise in Negro economic status through vocational education. Washington attained substantial support for whites and became a favorite of paternalistic politicians like Theodore Roosevelt. But the Washington program did not produce solid economic improvement in the lives of African American masses, nor was it intended to. Other black leaders grew impatient. The most brilliant was an effective dissenter during the early 20th century was W.E.B. Du Bois. Meanwhile, as Northern capital moved into the South after the Civil War, taking advantage of the large supply there of uh, cheap non-unionized labor, water power, rich coal mines, iron and oil resources, new mills, plants, and foundries were constructed in many southern communities. By 1880, this region had a fourth of the nation cotton mills. New railroads were built, and mining, lumber, lumbers, and timber industry were erected. Turpentine industries and naval stores moved into what is called <coughs> Wildgrass, Georgia, and town development began to take place in the Pine Woods. And by 1900, only 4% of African Americans were employed in skilled industries. The rest were unskilled laborers. They built roads, sewers, dug dishes, and others were employed in the agricultural pursuit as renters or tenants on farms. Black female found employment in the domestic and personal service. In 1903, Dr. W.B. Du Bois wrote in his famous The Souls of Black Folk. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relations of the darker to the lighter races of man in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea. From 1900 to 1920, the black population of New York City increased by 91,000, of Chicago by 79,000, of Philadelphia by 73,000, and of Detroit by 36,000. This movement of black from the south to the north was due to several factors. <coughs> Many blacks left the south because of lack of cultural depression, low wages for farm labor, poor housing conditions, lack of educational facilities, and the lack of proper protection from law enforcement and law violence. Black migrated from all parts of Georgia, but the exodus were greatest in the southwestern area, where the bold weaver they crossed the between a termite and a tank had entered the badly damaged cotton crops in Clinton County. For farmers ruined by the Boer Weaver, northern employment was a large sin. Over 40,500 people left the Auburn area in a 10 month period beginning in June 1916. Uh, Americans reported that also 
America reported that 3,000 blacks had migrated and that thousands of acres of land were abandoned. Thomasville, Bainbridge, and other small towns were also affected. Early in 1917, the Southwest Georgia Conference of the ALE Church reported that it offered traffic down attributing to the decrease to the fact that within the past few months, more than a thousand of our best band members had migrated to the north. Uh, the Alvin Herald observed that the Negro is leaving because he thinks he is not getting a square deal, and he is not. Also blaming white for the exodus was the Tipton Gazette, and, and it stated, whites have allowed Negroes to be lynched five at a time on nothing stronger than suspicion. They have allowed them to be white, kept, and their homes burned with only the weakest and most spasmodic effort to apprehend or punish those guilty, where any efforts were made at all. To help solve this problem, interracial meeting occurred in towns like Thomasville and Waycross, where whites made a pledge to improve conditions for blacks. Over 50,000 blacks left Georgia during the war years, and their departure set by efforts to build independent black institutions within the state. Other reasons given for the migration included the following. Bow weaver condition last year, which made cotton growing unprofitable for a number of Negro farmers, unrest among returning Negro troops who experienced more attractive conditions <coughs> away from farms during and after the war, and breakdown of the contract labor system. One young girl wrote to the Chicago defendant, the leader by newspaper who advertised and encouraged by the blacks to leave the North, to leave the South, rather go on North, and this girl, 15 years old, wrote, and I quote, I want to come there and work because I have been looking for work here for months and cannot find any. The only help I have is my mother, and she has four kids younger than me, and we have such a hard time until she is willing for me to go. May I continue to pour into the defendant's offers, offer, uh, office, rather, and a black woman wrote again to Abbott, who was the editor of the Chicago Defender, also a Georgian by birth, uh, and I quote, I read your paper, and I am asking about the drive on May 15. We want more understanding about it, for there is a great many of us that want to come into the port. Asia never give us any satisfaction when we ask for they don't want us to leave. Please put in your paper Saturday just what time the train will be here and the fare so we can be there on time. Many women are wanting to come. They are hard working women. The white folks tell us we have to have plenty of money to come north. If this is right, let us know. Also let us know where the train is going to stop. As they departed, they sang, Farewell, we are good and gone, and bound for the promised land, and bound for the land of hope. <clears throat> the black population of Thomasville were also affected by this migration. In 1910, the black population was 17,086, and by 1920, had increased to 17,263, and made up no more than 50% of the total population of Thomas County. Thus, Thomas County in 1920 was part of the Black Belt. Uh, the next two decades saw a black population of 15,856 in 1930, and by 1940, the population had increased for African Americans to 13,980, and about 44.7% of the total population of Thomas County. Majority of the black laborers by far were involved in some form of agricultural pursuit. Uh, 2,279 men were in the agriculture uh, labor as laborers and farmers or tenants, uh, and they also worked 579 women. Women also working in large numbers as domestic personal servants, about 1,619 according to the Central Bureau of Records. Uh, additionally, 199 black males were employed in the building industry, while another 318 were actively employed in salt and planting mills. Uh, and by 148 found work on railroads. And additionally, uh, during the 1930s, part of the New Deal efforts, 
uh, the WPA, the Work Project Administration, the NYA, the National Youth Administration, employed 129 males, while 11 females found employment in Thomas County. Therefore, the New Deal National Welfare Program did touch the lives for some in Thomas County, and as a result, in the national scheme of things, Black began to switch their political affiliation, and as the election of 1936 approached, Black switched from the Republican Party for the first time and started to vote the Democratic ticket. Those few who were able to participate in the election process. So, in conclusion, between World War I and the 1940s, tremendous change occurred in America, including a tide of Black migration to the North removal of hundreds of thousand black Americans from the land, uh, and the persistent struggle of African Americans to secure their rights as citizens. Yet throughout these years, there were extraordinary continuities as well. <coughs> None of these proved more important than the institution and custom of a segregated society. A society that white restricted <coughs> black aspiration, offered solace and protection, and provided a home base for fighting discrimination. The African American experience during the age of Jim Crow, the lives of people lived, the institution they created, and the legacies uh, they left were complex. The laws and practices of segregation meant limited jobs and educational opportunities, uh, legal discrimination, and social isolation, and oftentimes physical terror. But these were another reality that was well. African American people maintained families and community even under the most difficult circumstances. They created and sustained churches, struggled to transmit uh, aspiration and hope to the young, battled to find ways that would bring better schools, houses, and recreation, even if it had to be for the moment in a certain day to set. In the process, they created a world that white people knew hardly at all and understood even less. Thank you. Thank you, Titus, for a very fine synopsis of a important period in the history of the South and the history of the United States. Uh, and indeed, I speak for myself in his final statement that, uh, that I have known and know very little about the history and the lives of the blacks that have lived and worked and, and been part of our culture. And we are very fortunate that the second, second half of our program will bring it into real life experience for us here as we focus very locally on the southern hunting plantations in this area and the people that work and play there and talk with them about their experiences. So we're going to take a few minutes of break now and, and give you an opportunity to as refreshments to view the exhibits. Uh, we will assemble back here about four o'clock. You'll know uh, when to start moving back by the chimes on the doorbell. We'll start ringing in about five minutes till the hour. I would like to uh, remind the board members that there will be a, a quick meeting back in the business office uh, immediately after we adjourn. So please go back there immediately for a short, a short meeting. Thank you very much, and you adjourn for about half an hour. It's uh, not going to be possible for me to uh, recognize each one here this afternoon, but please look on the back and realize what a wonderful outpouring of community service has taken part in making this program possible. I would like to uh, comment about one or two groups, though, uh, because they are so much in uh, evidence here today. Uh, one is the uh, Thomas County Central High School Audiovisual Program. Mr. Dusty Carnegie and his students have provided all the audiovisual equipment here. They have prepared a feature videotape of this project, incorporating the oral histories of several of our informants, and have uh, added a great deal of the artifactual and environmental pictures to that video. And it will be available in the library in a few weeks, and I hope you'll go down and look at it, because it gives a synopsis of this whole project. <coughs> I would like to also uh, thank them for duplicating all our videotapes for us, and actually videotaping some of the some of the interviews. <coughs> uh, at this point, I would like to give a little bit of background 
uh, on the transition of our program this afternoon so that we will focus on the Southern Hunting Plantation. And uh, most of you may be native Thomas Countyans. Uh, most of you all may have known the history of this area from the time that we started to read and write. But uh, if some of you are like me who are new to this area for the last few years, uh, the history is, uh, has been a wonderful uh, revelation to me. And with a little bit of information about it, it will help you understand a little bit more about the personalities that are on our program this afternoon. Uh, the Southern Hunting Plantations are a development unique to the coastal areas of the Carolinas and Georgia, as well as this area, particularly the rolling red hills between here and Tallahassee. History records that it probably all began for Thomas County when Dr. Thomas Hopkins of Thomasville reported in 1874 to the Medical Association of Georgia that our piney woods were a most favorable place for the recovery from consumption and a wonderfully healthy environment in which to live. <coughs> Word spread fast of that report, and soon large numbers of people were coming to Thomasville. And by the 1880s, Thomasville was a major resort town. <coughs> Among our visitors were families from the northern industrial cities, successful businessmen who had led America to the unprecedented heights of growth and development through railroads, steel, oil, coal, and shipping. Families now of great wealth. They fell in love with our city of roses and our countryside. They also came to enjoy the great bird hunting in the long leaf pine forest that, 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 that by then covered much of the old plantation and cotton land. But times had been and were tough then for the agricultural plantations. Many long time owners had to sell, and as more and more large tracts of plantation land went on the market, the northern industrialists took the opportunity to establish permanent homes and shooting preserves. By the 1900s, essentially all the rich plantation land, some 300,000 acres, more than 70 plantations in the Red Hills between here and Tallahassee, had been, had been converted to quail hunting for the pleasure of northern hunters and their guests. To operate these large plantations, a skilled management and talented and industrious workforce is needed. The continued operation of these plantations now for more than a century is testimony to the success of these men and women who worked and lived and worked for the Northern owners. The story of their life, the rich environment, and the support provided by the plantation owners to the employees and their families, and the legacy of the Southern Hunting Plantation in the first half of this 20th century is the focus of today's discussion. I think you will all enjoy it. I would like now to introduce and present Mr. Jack Hadley, who has done all the yeoman's work on collecting these histories and coordinating that part of the activities. And he will introduce the uh, individuals who have made this project or this. Jack? Thank you, Dr. Sis. Uh, first of all, I'd like to really say I want to thank all the people that I interviewed. It just been it's just been a treat to be able to uh, talk to each one of you, go into your homes, and it's just, it's, it's been great. Uh, all of you knew that I was myself born and raised up on the plantation, so you could not give me a bunch of, you know, information that I wasn't too sure. But I really appreciate it very much. Uh, but, uh, but it was great. First, I'd like to introduce uh, some of these my relatives up here. My sister, Estella Pantley uh who is one of them that I interviewed early. Uh, <laughs> Sam Green, <laughs> Frank Delaney, <laughs> Tom Hadley, <laughs> Wendy Johnson, Also on the program, you might notice Miss Alice Massey. She called me last night and told me that she would not be able to come up because of illness. And uh, she was one of our key players in this interview as well. And uh, but she said she we she would have us in our heart as she think about the program today. 
And uh, again, I want to ask that all the rest of the uh, interviewers please stand so that people can just sort of turn around so they can see who you are. Okay. <coughs> all the people that I interviewed.
So you you hear me refer to uh, these uh, men and a lot of women out there as Uncle and Aunt, and we are not uh, kin biological by blood or anything, but it's the association and the love and concern that we have for one another on the plantation. We always refer to as Uncle or Aunt or cousin and this type of thing. Now. Watching Uncle Sam and George Walden and Herbert Ryan Tree and Arthur Meth and my uncle Arthur that called Slayer, watching those fellas for get ready on Wednesdays, and especially if uh, the 20th of May was on Friday. I always like for the 20th of May to be on Friday so that it would be midweek and we could always start celebrating like midweek. <laughs> and um, they, they would start getting uh, things together on Wednesday plantation crew and see it was truck driver, it was his kind of responsibility to get the tables and benches in place under the big walnut trees in front of Hubba Ryan Trail House, I think the best, uh, best of mine was probably the last stand. And uh, just, we dig this pit in the ground, we had a crew to dig a hole in the ground, they had a pit to cook, and the younger boys, myself and Sam Green Jr. and Water Elf and Tom Jones and John, we were always hanging around. They hear the fellas tell jokes at night as they cook. And it was a big thing for us to just kind of ease up and hear. But during that time, uh, uh, Doug Meehan didn't do a lot of talking in front of boys, so the things we heard, we had to kind of slip it here. And that was just a challenge. It was just a challenge for us to be able to just go up there at night and kind of slip and hear that one story. So we could laugh about the rest of the year until the next you know, preparation for the 20th of May. It was important, and then the day of the 20th of May, all the families would come together, and boy, we just, we just really had a good time. Have a ball. Enjoy it. Yes, I do. I, uh, during the time I was quite small, but uh, my father would come and pick us up, and it was a group of us. And when we get there, he said, Well, here's Goat with all his children, because they called him Goat. All the men on the plantation had a nickname. And so, like, uh, the lady here said, His father's name Bear, and mine was named Goat. So, <laughs> I had all the children in that one little car. We had, I remember Dad had a T mall. Well, I guess it was something like a 22 or 23 or something like that, T. And uh, we would all just be piled in there, holding some, holding the other some, the little ones standing up in the back. And when we get there, then we all just be smell, you smell the meat before you get there. That barbecue goat and barbecue pork and whatever it was they have all cooking there, smelling good, and we just couldn't wait to get there. Boy, the first thing we do, we just, we get there, we'll just have to start digging in. And after that, then we played rain plays, and we just had a good time telling, listening to old people tell joke, jokes. And it was quite enjoyable to me. I always look forward to these picnics that they would have there. I like Dr. Rogers. I have done with him to the squirrel and the rat. I have had no experience on plantation. <laughs> and my life has been designed to avoid as much as possible. <laughs> I was going off, I used to sort of sail by 319. I wanted no part of plantation. My image of plantation life is certainly different from what I read in these uh, oral history tapes here. I'm just surprised and amazed that to me, Plantation life was one stage from slavery. And that's why I always experience it. Being from Virginia and being you know, all around the world, I always look at one as if something's being quite negative. However, reading these transcripts and reading this book that I've read for the last two weeks, I can't believe that you know, everything is so nice and beautiful, and everybody on this web. I think I'm going to move on one of these plantations very soon. <laughs> I, I have visited the plantation on a tour uh, prior to my students in the main, and I did see the black people back recently, and I was upset that I could imagine slavery and everything else. Then I read this book, I think it must be Cyril Bradford, it's somewhere like 1900. She wrote a book, and she was talking about what had happened after slavery. And having read that book, it, it reinforced my image of a plantation. But it seems with these photographs and these pictures, you have really changed my whole view on plantation and life. It seemed to me from reading your transcripts that life on the plantation was far better than life 
in Thomasville itself. That there was a division between the blacks on their farm and the blacks in the city. And it seemed like those on their farm fared very well. Now, I don't know if it's fancy, but she must have been something else. Because as soon as she financed people's education, divided schools, divided churches, took them off to college, they made them free loans and fed them and kept them well, and they made forty dollars a month. Now, I don't know any way in my historical research where black people in the thirties and forties made forty dollars a month each. And nothing to do with it. You know, you had everything provided for you. So I wonder, I know all my friends from college have done so well and got so many degrees and you have such nice car, have such nice home. You had a gold mine. $40 a month for each person. It is amazing. The other thing I can't understand is that I keep seeing the name happy. How many happiness were there? Where did they come from? Every plantation was a happy plantation. Now, who was the first Mr. Happy that we talk about here? Another thing I want to talk about is the double barrel cousins. What is the world is a double barrel cousins? Someone said in this book that you had some Mr. Copeland who I have taken before, talked about double barrel cousins. You just me the, the, the rich money you receive, the free education, and double barrel cousins, and also what's the name of Rodney Witch? Thank you very much. Mr. Cohen, how about the double barrel cousins? Ticket, the game. That was a later date. 
But after you do it, go in, you ain't a one of a kind. Lenny food. Lenny girl. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just one of the best things that I have ever witnessed. And I look back with a new suit and go in the Pillar Hill on Easter. And that was the joy of my salvation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have lots of memories of uh, Easter because, just like my cousin said over here, he looked forward to a new suit. Mm -hmm. I look forward to a new dress mm -hmm. and shoes to match, and not to match, but just so long as they were new. And uh, on Easter, we would always have to get to go early so that all the little kids would line up from the main house across the lawn over to the tennis court because that's where we ate in the tennis court. And uh, we was, the reason why we had to line up like that was we had to pass the Easter baskets. And the baskets were just loaded with, with uh, sandwiches and cookies and just all kinds of things in there. And you might get a little Easter rabbit or something in it too. And then ice cream. And uh, so we would have to pass these baskets, you know, one to the other on to the get to the tennis school. And then after we go in and everybody would get finished and all we get we finish eating. And then Dr. Uh, Walton, he was a dentist here, right? Dentist that used to be here years ago. He had a group that was sing with him, and they they were from the uh, first uh, from the uh, St. Thomas Church, St. Thomas Methodist Church, and uh, they would sing. And after they would sing a few songs, then uh, uh, Reverend of White, I think he's from the Christopher Church, Presbyterian Presby 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 Church, where he would always speak, you know, to us. And after we get through with all, you know, all that, and we just, in fact, we just have a good time. After that, we get, we leave out of the court, uh, the tennis court, and go back out on the lawn, and they would have potato races mm -hmm. and uh, relay races, all kinds of races. And then when you the egg races, we would hunt eggs too. And uh, we would, and when you get through with all the different races, then you come back up to the front of Miss Pansy and Miss Harvey, you know, before she died and after she died, too, they still had. Then you would get a gift. And of course, they would give everybody something, you know. All the kids would get something, but you know, everybody tried to be a winner. And it was just a lot of fun. And then after that, then we go out in the woods and hunt uh, East Eggs. And after that, then, of course, they had a puzzle. And it was like uh, rows, uh, I mean, pathways all the way through bushes. And you could get in there and get lost. And you go, you go all through this, this, uh, oh, this, oh, and it was really, it was just, it just, it was a lot of journey getting there. You can't find, you talk to somebody over in that path, and you can't get over there. You want to get to them, you can't get over there, they can't get to you. And finally, we just have to keep on to finally, you know, we, we got our way out of there. I hear somebody come and get us. But it feels a lot of memories on Easter time. <laughs> Well, I wake up to the foundation of a very good to me, because I've been knowing this past for a long time. Well, she treated me very good, had plenty to eat. She had a nurse to come around to see my husband was sick, and a doctor, and he would come out. And he would marry, if a wife gets labor, she would be the dead wife for her. She was really nice. And she remained in she was afraid she wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 she didn't get as much money, but she took it over the years. There were different things for her. And that's why you know, I like it so much. Well, I can say something about the 4th of July because it was on St. Cola. St. Cola was owned by the same people that owned Melrose. And uh, that's where. Uh, they would have ice cold watermelons. They would have
have a barbecue goat, barbecue ribs. They'd have all kinds of barbecue. And they'd have, um, uh, yeah, that's right, a drunken stew. And kind of like uh, Frank was saying, I just never get five hours for the men who cook it. But Deacon Roosevelt King, uh, during his lifetime, they, they would cook all night. Cook that barbecue and stuff all night down there. And uh, let's see, who else? Uh, but Will Dawson used to cook it during his lifetime. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and they, they were uh, cooking that stuff. My, my father in law, after the year passed, it came over to him to, to do the cooking, and he did a lot of the cooking. But they'd have a big baseball game. All the Flat Nations had ball teams. And they'd have a big ball game going on on the 4th of July. We have nothing but a lot of fun. Now, my mother tells me that that was one 4th of July that the people didn't eat the watermelon. Too cold. It was too cold. <laughs> All around the cold zone. You couldn't get them to eat the high school watermelon. But that was unusual. But that particular year, I guess not remember. <laughs> it was too cold to eat, to eat it. Uh, but uh, we always had a good time. Not to be a young boy, we'd be running and playing around by ourselves. And uh, speaking about this, this witch business. Uh, <laughs> Now, ride, I don't know nothing about riding the witch, but my aunt used to tell me that witches used to ride her. She said that she could hear, she leaves it in the uh, key in the door, and she could hear the key fall out on the floor. The next day she would feel something waiting down the bed, and after that she would be helpless. She would just, just be there now until after the witch gets through. And, and that was it. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know whether that's an answer to your question. I'll ask that question because wherever you go throughout the deep south and talk to black people, but every day, like, they all think of someone riding the witch. It's not just cutie here. It seems to be something about riding the witch that I've been interested in because everybody talks about riding the witch. And, and uh, I could just, just surprise this here in this, this area right here. And someone mentioned about how the dogs had to run one night. That uh, something happened, the dogs came back and chased their tail. And just went crazy all over once and saw something. Yes, sir, you want to feel that? <laughs> Mr. Bill Walton. My father trained down at the Pepper Hill all his life. And about riding the witches, I've been hung with him. It always happened on a Friday night. <laughs> the dogs come back, smacking the tail, look, and uh, when he do, he said, Let's go home. The, rich, the witches are riding tonight. <laughs> we'll leave. We'll come back in. And uh, sometimes the dog will treat to a tree about 10 feet high. And you look up that tree, there was nothing up there. And all of a sudden, the dog would take off and start running. And snap it, biting it, they tell you. And he would say the witches was riding that night. <laughs> Uh, I'd like for um, Mr. Doc Hadley and Mr. Sam Green and the others who wish to to talk about apparently the number one sport or uh, sort of organized sport was baseball. Could you all, you all tell us something about the Pebble Hill baseball team, the uniforms, maybe some of that star players? Well, Pebble Hill had a nice baseball team there. And Miss Pebble followed them up. And she would knock all those off to go see the game. Now, St. Colin, they had a nice ball game. And we take a uh, Wednesday plantation. Going to plantation had a ball game. And uh, she played one to one, and one would beat her. She could climb right back the next day to her work to beat that. <laughs> and we would have loved to have that, but we would have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> so we had nice days on it then. Then she had a, a theater out there. You know, he won't like the team. Now she had money 
that chairman of Japan. And we go to twice a week. And Malka, he got into it. He built him a theater up there. And she had a school up there for us. She would get the, the pictures from time, real from time, bring out the every day. Two cars, one going, one coming. And now we see the same show we see in time, we see it in that theater. She was very really nice to all those out there. To me, I know what you want. Everybody else. And then the picnic, it was always a good picnic. Crunch Day, 4th of July, Christmas. She gave me Easter Sunday. Well, I was being an Easter Sunday rush. I had some information. <laughs> Somebody talked about it. We used to call it showboat. So I was the first talking about it. Somebody was a showboat about it. The showboat was, was on Merrill. It was on Merrill's. And uh, it was built sort of like a boat. You'd go across a... They, they had a pool of water, and you go across a, a gang plant to get in there. And the inside, uh, the way they had the, the walls sticking, but just like old, old lumber. It was just wasting away, you know, that's the way it was fixed. Uh, but those uh, those red benches they had in there, they were so slick. I, tell you, I, I don't know how they got in that slick. <laughs> they, 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 were so, they were slick. That was a nice building. And uh, we would see, just like you say, the same movies that they would have uptown, we get to see them. I think the, the northern people would see them like the winds, then we'd see them on Thursday. Anyway, they were today and running like that. And uh, it was, was was very good. That's the first time I saw Snow White, I believe it was Snow White itself. <laughs> Now, Lady, what about the on, the on the Pebble Hill and the other plantations, uh, church services, the religious services on, on, on the plantation that were churches, were they not? Yes, sir. Uh, on our plantation on Pebble Hill, the uh, Piney Grove Missionary Baptist Church that uh, my dad told me came out of a, a plot in the church I up to uh, Tallahassee Highway. And on uh, Pebble Hill, there's, there's Piney Grove. Uh, Willie here, my neighbor, served as a uh, deacon and the chairman of their there. That church was provided for anybody, and especially people living on the plantation. Uh, we, she cared for it, we painted it, put the roofs on it, and just, the only thing the, the members had to do was really attend. Uh, she didn't even lick the pastors for them, but everything showed her that uh, as far as caring for the building and the ground and this type of thing was uh, provided for us uh, by labor from the plantation. Then uh, she would always come to the Christmas service that was held at Piney Group. And this was a service similar to the Easter program. I, I, I wasn't old enough to remember the Easter program, but I remember the Christmas activities when each family would be recognized and given money from the smallest to the, the oldest. And there again, we'd be passed you know, ice cream and the cookies and the fruits and things. We just really just have a day filled with um, activities, singing of carols and young people that they had learned to play instruments in the high school band and the thing would, would come and play. I think with Richard and Jake's brother, uh, Richard, it was a twin, and I was a twin, and he played the trumpet, and I played the trumpet, so we, we kind of bowed each other at the Christmas program. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, later years, she gave money to for an addition on uh, our church of Plotman. We had a problem with the, the finest people around here. She had a special made uh, for our church, and we had to put a lot of... Uh, she had to invest a lot of money because the steeple weighed so much that you could crane and bring it down and then we had to build up the front of the church to even hold it. So um, it's, it's real pretty. I'd like to have something to say about Piney Grove since I'm a member there. It, uh, I was a very young young boy when that church was good. I guess it was I guess back in 35 or something like that. But, uh, it was uh, third men, they tell me, they were good in the woods. The church caught fire and burned down. So she didn't make it no better, no worse. She built a church there. And, and that church today is still a modern church. It was built in 36. Real nice church. They built it. Uh, 
if you haven't if you haven't had a chance to go out there and, and go into that church, you need to go because it's that yellow pine, you just you can't find it now. And if you could find it, you would have a lot of money to pay. Because it it is it is a beautiful view. Beautiful. And I would like and I would like to say, uh, I was a member of O'Clockton Missionary Baptist Church, which is about uh, maybe a mile and a half down the highway. And <clears throat> there weren't too many people in there that were saved. And I'm um, being a habit, you know, I was interested in saying it. And so when I was 10 years old and joined the church, my father took me to the choir. And uh, but anyway, we didn't have a piano in, in O'Clockton Church. But they bought a piano for Piney Grove Church. And see, on second Sundays, we would go to, or everybody would go to uh, Piney Grove Church, and then on fourth Sundays, everybody would go to O'Clock Church. So we had this combined choir. And uh, so on second Sundays, we, our choir would, you know, we joined in with the Piney Grove Choir and singing the choir there. And I was the first pianist for that church. And then it just went on from in my family, down, on down, down, so everybody, everybody left home to play the piano, and then start getting some idea. But it was really uh, one of the first churches that I started in. I started going to Sunday school. Well, no, I started, well, it was about the second church that I started going to Sunday school. I was real small. I would say about three, three or four years old. My dad used to take me to Sunday school there. So it seemed like it was my own church, although it was ever there some others. And, and while I'm talking, I would like to say again about our Christmas. Um, getting back to that. Um, we would have um, the Christmas celebration there at Piney Grove Church. Where long years ago, when I was small, we would his parents would have the Christmas celebration in the uh, garage, one of the, the garages at Pebble Hill, and uh, they would uh, they would call up you know all the families to be and stop them the small family from going to the big ones, which would probably be the last one. <laughs> and uh, and and you can imagine seeing kids say two or three years old walking around with a pink basket. And in that basket would be their gifts. And also whatever, some toys and then fruit and nuts and whatever. And every year, the girls, if you got them, you would, you would get two dresses, two print dresses, every year. And one year you would get a sweater. The next year you would get a raincoat. And it was like that, back and forth, every year for a long time. And then finally, his parents would start giving money. So that's the last I remember. She used to give money on Christmas. But still, we would have those programs. We always have to get up and sing. I tell you that most of the people in the choir were either happy or around trees. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Miss Nash is not here, but it seems like you're reading the transcript of certain her activities. She was real close to Mrs. Yeah. Poe, and that she went to England. Took her along, one of her fancy hats, so she'd be able to go to the races. And she had her own private room. And you know, that kind of thing is unusual. You get a chance to go to England. With a brand new head and you got your own private room, you go to the races, what have you. And the day she married a man named Arthur, who was a big baseball player. Yeah. And when the World War II started, he had to milk the cows. He got upset. If you want to milk the cows, you never to Detroit. She refused to go. She finally went to stay one year. I told her to come back home to uh, Pepper Hill Plantation. And he, he had to come back or stay in Detroit. He packed up and came back home also. And it seemed like they had just a wonderful time, and she must have been almost like a sister to to Miss Patch evidently. And the other thing, reading uh, Rock's uh, tape, he mentioned something that I thought was very unique, and that was that being in the house and this beautiful plantation, all these nice things, that the average black person had their first exposure to the finer things of life. And therefore, that's why. The folks from the Dr. Plantation wanted to have nice cars and nice jewelry and fine simple because that's all they were used to. They were, otherwise, it was a learning experience to make the, the black people living in the plantation to be exposed to a much higher culture than those living in the city. And then when they came and got their own things, got the very best things. It's something that being a nanny in a big wealthy home in the city or something like that. In other words, much of the culture of black people who desire finer things in life came through the association of different white people who actually owned the plantation. And that was kind of unique to me. And did you want to make some comments about that, Mr. Hadley? Uh, 
It is great, uh, indeed a great pleasure to attempt. I'm watching the life of the cook, and I'm a cook. Now, I have <laughs> never witnessed such good food. We still see the life. I basically all because of the life of the star I never That's a rich cook. And we have great turkey, duck, fish, just name them. Dove pies, oh my, my. And uh, and it was just if I had to live a life over there, I would prefer living on the planet. One of them. Good life to do. Because of that, uh, uh, Lena Sample was probably during my time in his fancy. I say fresh made, so to speak. And then after her place, she comes and Alice went on with Miss Lawyer that failed. Uh, she she stayed around that house. My Lord, that is 25 years ago. So if you, anything you want to know that Cousin Alice can't help because she didn't hear the devil knows. She was seen made those trips to the rest of the many days without seeing a girl for us. <laughs> I, I'm going to blow your mind now. Uh, my uncle Sam Bunny was the biggest black man, he was a colored man then. But <laughs> 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 All that he did was slept all day and carry that shotgun all night. <laughs> You didn't worry about anybody coming up there because they knew that Sam was there. He was walking all around, punching keys all around the place. Uh, and they had the garage, and they had the main house, and they had, uh, just like they were saying, my mother was a dairy maid. And uh, she worked in the dairy. Now, the floor in that dairy was, it was tall, so slick that you could almost fall down. It didn't have to be wet. And uh, everything in that dairy was white. She ran a separator and uh, kept everything clean and, and made butter and all that sort of thing. Besides, she uh, would go and clean the showboat and she would clean uh, the, the, the boys' cottage down there, the mansion cottage, and also she would tell Mo Griffin to uh, wash the clothes and things. Mo Griffin was the cook down at the Waldorf. That's where the, the women who they got to the town stayed all the week and worked and they carried them back. Uh, my dad was a chauffeur. He hauled them back and forth. So uh, now the Waldorf was a nice place. They all had their own rooms in the Waldorf. Their own rooms. They had the uniforms and their food paid for. Well, all they had to do was to man, come and pick them up on Monday, bring them out. They worked all the week and carried them back the food and everything. Now, Mo Griffin could cook. She could cook. And, uh, I, I enjoyed living in the wall up because when we went north and came back, that's where we lived for a while until they found us a place to live. My mother and I we were separated from father. So I lived in the wall up. And some of them were not coming and going. And the uniforms that they wore in the morning, they wore their white dresses, the white pinafores, and the white uh, little caps in the mornings. And uh, the butlers wore overalls, with a white shirt, and his bow tie and all in the morning. Now, in the afternoon, the women put on their black and, and their lace, lacy looking aprons and another type of cap. And the men wore blue suede suits in the evening. So that's the way that's the way it was in the main house. Uh, you had uh, butlers and you had uh, what's that uh, pantry maids and, and all because people working in that. <laughs> I just thought I'd share it with you. Thank you very much. Thomas Stephson Johnson, who founded Pebble Hill in the mid 1820s, built the first house there. It was just a cottage, although he added to it. And he died, and his daughter, Julia, inherited Pebble Hill. And this was in 1849, 1848. And she married a man named John W.H. Mitchell. And he came there, and then they built the second Pebble Hill which was built by John Wynn, 
John Wynn, some of you people in here know his reputation. He built the courthouse and all of his recognized land as a major architectural figure. Well, anyhow, they lived in it. Uh, John Mitchell came home from the Army in 1865 and died shortly thereafter. And Julia kept the plantation going. This one of many indomitable Southern women, black and white. <coughs> she died in 1881. Then her children sold it off. And finally, Judge Hopkins, H.W. Uh, Hopkins, bought it in 1895 and sold it the next year. He was also dealing in real estate. He sold it to the Hannah family. And then later, uh, Mel Hammond's daughter, Kate Ireland, and uh, later Harvey, she got it and kept it and built it up. And still, that same building, lasting from John Wynn in 1849, then the Great Fire came in 1934 and burned Pebble Hill. And then uh, Miss Kate uh, built it back in the grandeur that you know it now. It took about two years to build it. And every, all my research showed that it, was, it matched the new building in terms of people being employed in Thomas County. People went out and worked building that Pebble Hill. And I just wonder if any of the panel would like to comment about what life was like in the Great Depression here, and particularly out at Pebble Hill. What were y'all's lives like then? And that excuse that little history lesson in how we got to Pebble Hill. But that is how we got there. I would like to comment on uh, the, during the years between uh, 32 40 was the years that I lived out there. And uh, there were, being a lot of us in family, at first, they would give us four quarts of milk a day. And every day, they would bring home that, they would bring home those four quarts of milk. And uh, so that went on for a long time. And then finally, uh, she told that, she said, Dennis says, so your family's increasing. She said, I'm going to give you a count. So she gave us one of those fine Jersey cows that they have out there. And she did have some fine ones. And uh, so we kept had that one cow for a while. And with that cow, we didn't have a calf. Her name was, was uh, Foxman. So Foxman didn't have a calf. So she gave us another cow. Her name was Ivy. And today, Ivy is buried right in front of the uh, um, dairy in the home front lawn. But anyway, we kept that cow. That cow was still there um, when I got married. And that cow had, I know, at least three calves to my remembrance. And whenever she would have a cave, her bag would get so big until the, she would have to be milked three times a day. And my brothers would get up early in the morning around 5 o'clock and go out and milk go out. And uh, then at 12 o'clock, we was at school. Mother would have to go and milk it. Then her bag would drive the ground. And it was really rich milk. I mean, the cream would really just be <laughs> the cream on the top. And I was so ruined until I would even drink milk unless it had it was cream. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, we, uh, we, we, you know, when I learned how to uh, make butter. My grandmother brought a family of children, some kind of children, wood cake. And we would put the milk, we keep the milk until it is sour and then put it in the children and then I learned how to make butter. And, uh, and all with, along with that, uh, my brothers would get up like uh, one with milk at home and the other one, else he would go to the dairy. He had a job working there. He would go there early in the morning, drive five o'clock and milk the cows. That was before they got those machines to milk the cows, they had milk the cows by hand. And he would go there and he would milk the cows and his um, <coughs> Tina Reed, his relative, she was in the dairy. She was in the dairy. She was uh, working in the dairy with the milk. And, uh, and whenever they would, she would make butter. Well, you know, the butter then wasn't in, was in uh, uh, sticks. It was all in one block, pound blocks. And, uh, when, and when they would cut the butter out, the little ends and the little ends, she would put it in my brother's lunch bucket. And he would bring home that gallon of lunch bucket full of butter. And I would make biscuits with butter. Every morning I'd get up and make those 48 biscuits. <laughs> Mother always had to have a little thin hook and cornbread. I mean, a little thin hook and cornbread up on top of the stove. 
And then in the afternoon, they do the same thing. It was a bigger pan, it was big enough. I kind of convinced them before to eat in this place. Amen. And, uh, because I never eat with one or two, but I had some brothers. <laughs> Some brothers that really would go for the one, one, one uh, evening we had. Uh, no, we have Sir David Brian King, and uh, we had a patch on my mother's, on my grandmother's face, and he was that cane, and so he would grind, you know, he would grind the cane every other time we'd have Sir. And uh, my brother would put, take a biscuit and punch a hole in it with his finger and put a certain eye in it, like that. And he told me one day, he said, like, five biscuits today. <laughs> so you can see why I didn't have a big hole in his business. Amen. 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 From reading the, the transcripts, it seemed to me that there were a lot of people on each plantation lived around the big houses work and servants around the big house. And also there have been some farm hands somewhere on the plantation. But there were other people coming in everything from the city somewhere to work on the plantation. But I didn't read anything with any conflict. Now, in that kind of environment with all these people together, all ever having a good time, fun and games going on. That might be some arguments. Who kept law and order? I'm trying to find it. Who kept the peace on these five different plantations under those circumstances? That, that, that was uh, that was always uh, uh, I guess at one time it was called the overseer, the uh, superintendent, and now later it was called boss men. They they was kind of like uh, the sheriff, so to speak. But he always had him a black deputy, his chief deputy. I mean, uh, he he was kind of like the sheriff, but there was always. Uh, that black male or female, a lot of times it was uh, women that uh, was kind of like the peacemaker on, on plantation. But even though uh, you had uh, workers coming out of town to work on plantation, there was, there was a screening committee. I mean, this thing was not all smiles and fun and games, my friends. No. There was people on these plantations that uh, was kind of like would decide who was going to work out there. Uh, <laughs> even though they had superintendents and boss men, they would come and say, now, well, the Hubbard or Arthur or Dennis or Val, you know, you, you, you ask him about helping in the, in the dairy, there's a guy. And he said, no, I, I don't think I want it. And that was, they would only get people that they could get along with. So you, you, that reduced the friction, you know, reduced the chance for a lot of friction. But uh, they, they, the plantation, you just couldn't get out there. I mean, they, they kind of decide whether or not you were going to live on the plantation. Blake's did that. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Eton and I have been having most of the fun, uh, although you have too, listening uh, to the answers, but it seems that all, just out of simple justice that we often, in the last few minutes, throw the discussion over to the audience. So if anyone in the audience uh, has a question, would, would like to ask a question, uh, here in the last few minutes, uh, that this will be the time to do it. So, Professor Eton and I open it up to you all. Uh, I have one question I'd like to address. This is a school board. Will you tell about the school students? Yes, and you were one of my classmates. <laughs> 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 and she was, uh, that is, uh, her name is. Ramona Hill, uh, Spearman Hill. At that time, the Spearmans was a big family too out there, by the way, and they were farmers. And Ramona was the valedictorian of our class, and I was salutatorian. And we were the only two girls in that class, a class in the class of seven. So we graduated from the seventh grade at the O'Clockman School, which is on Pebble Hill Plantation, but it is named in O'Clockman, I guess because O'Clockman Church is right down the road from it. And it's built just like, uh, is that the only picture there? On those pictures? And it, the two schools were built just alike. The one they called Pebble Hill, it was up there near the main house, and the one they called O'Clockman, they were built just alike. And uh, there were like two rooms, and the, the one room, was for the beginners through the third grade, fourth, third or fourth grade, fourth grade, and the other room was fifth through seventh grade. And uh, we would, every Friday, we would always have some kind of activity going on. And sometimes um, we would have plays and 
if the mothers would come out and fix picnic baskets, you know, like at school closing time. And then at graduation time, the girls would all be dressed up and we'd have our graduation exercises on the front porch. There was a porch there. And then the parents and sometimes Pansy would be there too and some of the other uh, white people that were there on the plantation, they would come to our, 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 our plays. And they were real, they were real, you know, plays. We actually come out and then we had dances. And, uh, and I remember I learned, I first uh, started taking music out there to Miss um, <coughs> Walter. Was the, she was one of the teachers, but she started giving, she started giving me music. And uh, we, we like, I liked this one little duet. And for school closing, she, uh, she and I played this little duet together. I was real nervous and everything, but anyway, we got to play this little duet together. And so it was a lot of enjoyment. And it's not like, it's different from the way school was doing today. At 12 o'clock, we would go out and play rain plays. And then there was a lady named Miss Gerard. She was a home demonstration agent. We had what we call a girls' voyage club. And in this, this club, she would come around, I'd say maybe once every two weeks or once a month, and we would um, go to our teacher, Miss Austin's house, and do our cooking. She would teach us how to cook different little things. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, you know, a lot of enjoyment. I learned how to fix little dishes. And then when, uh, uh, when Saturday come, when Friday evening come, and Dad would have to make out the grocery list, I would get my little recipe out from him and cooking at school. And then I would write down all the little things that I need. And when Dad would look at the nest, you know, he wasn't making them only about $60 a month. And uh, he would look at the nest and he'd say, well, what is all this down here? I said, I said, I said, I'm going to fix up, you know, whatever my little dessert was. And that's what happened. He said, that's going to make, that's too much. That's too much to make. Gross, we ain't going to be too much. Can't get all, I, I can't get all that. I said, Dad, Dad, please, pretty, please, please get it for me so I can make this little dessert. And uh, I'm making a special with you. I just butter them up, you know, so he, 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 he,
And then later, they consolidated Cherokee, O'Clockney, and it was another one. Rocky. Rocky. And Rocky. But that's when I met Frank and Tinico. That's when I met Frank. And the children, the motto they established at Liberty High School, this is a place of culture. And anybody that came that was different, the teachers didn't have to do anything. The children would educate them. <laughs> so we kept news and threads and a room full of clothes. And they would sew the dresses if they were too long. They provided them with anything. And Miss Pansy, I have a thing. Whenever we would have those recitals at the end of the year, Miss Pansy would come, the people from Susanna Plantation. It was just the family. And anything that we needed, it was provided. And then we send the nurse to see to see about the children, to give those shots and the immunization. It was just wonderful. And I just was amazed when I found such culture at Beachton and in surrounding places. And then Mr. I taught Bill. And it was and I used to, at that time, they would, it was always proud for the teacher to spend the night. And I would go and spend the night, and I remember one Easter, Mrs. Walden, or Mr. Josh, I didn't go home then for Easter. They brought me to Pebble Hill Plantation. And it was the most fantastic thing I ever seen in my life. Order, peace, and the people were well dressed. <laughs> it was in a beautiful city, and that's where I met and married my husband. <laughs> John Johnson, Ag and Robin Tempton. I'd like to raise this Miss Copeland, maybe Miss Mansi, or really any of the panels. Was most interested in the school games that were played. I saw one of the wonderful photographs over here about hot cross buns, uh, the game, and any other school games that they may have played at recess. Can you share with us on that? Well, I don't know about that one, but that was a young lady, Elfrey. She's a Mrs. Gibson now. She lives in Thomasville. And at recess time, you would be on duty, but you really didn't have to bother. You just watched. And they used the, the one I remember most. High those windows way over yonder. And give me a, a, a bowl to drink some water. And they would skip around and bounce around. And uh, that was one that I remember, but not the one you mentioned. And a tisk and a casket. I lost my yellow basket. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'm also a product of the double bill of their cousin. <laughs> <laughs> and I comment um, that addresses to Dr. Rogers. I'm also one of the historians from my family, and I'm interested in finding out more about my African ancestry. I am also a descendant of Simon Hadley. I'm a great great granddaughter who's married to Cutter Hill on the plantation. He was my great great grandfather. What I'd like to find out if there is any information that you might have available, or maybe you can direct me, whereby these plantations, when they got the uh, slaves back when they went, were there any records kept um, as to their identity? I looked into some sources and all I can find that they always kept records of there were maybe so many male slaves and so many females. There were no names given. So I don't really know my African identity. And I'm trying to find that. And I'm wondering if there's someone you can talk to. Well, uh, Professor Eton, and, and he knows as well as I do, one great source of <coughs> uncovered census in terms of numbers and in terms of first names of slaves because they would take an agricultural census, a, a population census, and also a slave census. Uh, it's not real complete until you get, well, it's never really complete, but 1850 and 1860 would give you a lot of information. I'll be glad to press it on. One great puzzle is the habits. 
Uh, is, there, is there not, and you all can tell me, is there a California connection? Yeah, we have some in California yeah. and uh, that's, that's Arizona. The clue. You can get that. I believe that. All I right. know, we might they, they migrated from Virginia. The Hadley migrated from Virginia, and they came from there to North Carolina, from there to Thomasville, or to this great Thomas County area. And I know all about the three sisters and all of that. But that's only on the white side of the family. And I'm interested in knowing and seeing this. I'd be glad to be more specific with you, and I'm sure Professor Eton would too. And right after the talk, if you let me have your address on the line. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yes. yes, I was talking about the Hadley family. Yes. 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 It's in the court house and documented for the family of Simon Hannity. Of course, you might not go, but the way the Hatties came about, Simon Hannity had a black mistress. And of course, there they had some sons of Jasper and White and Hannity. And Dottie King, of course, I had that to where it got it from the court house, and she'd like to get it. And I can give it to you from there, going back down to present time. And of course, it's documented in the courthouse right now. Simon had it, of course, but he made his will. And the will is a funny thing, but it's true. He gave to uh, Charlotte, that was mistress. He gave her a car with 30 bushels of corn. <laughs> and of course, uh, she could sell the place and all she wanted. Give her so much land, I bet it's just I have it. And also, she gave, gave to the son uh, Watkins his revolver, he wheeled that to him, and to Jasper, his shotgun. And he could live on the place as long as he wished, because he was married at that time, uh, which uh, his sons were not my great grandfather. I have that, to uh, just in the courthouse to document. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Sure, by now you can see that there are a thousand stories to be told here. And we've only been able to talk with a very few of individuals who shared in this period. Uh, hopefully, in the future, we'll be able to expand this and give more audience to these individuals and to the rich information that they bring to us. We thank you all for coming. Certainly, we thank the panelists and the people who gave us their oral histories. We thank the moderators for their expert questioning and enlightenment of us this afternoon. Uh, I also want to thank again the Georgia Humanities Council who helped, who helped make this project possible, as well as the Thomas Historic Thomasville, Thomas County Historical Museum, the Jack Hadley <coughs> Black History Memorial Memorabilia Collection, uh, and of course the um, many other individuals, particularly I haven't mentioned Tom Hill, the curator here at the museum who has put together this exhibit, this photographic exhibit, and all the artifacts that you see exhibited here have been provided by the individuals and the families that are represented in these oral histories, and they are from the period that we have talked about today. So before you go, please take the time to look at these items. The museum will be open until 6, so take your time to go through the museum if you haven't seen what you'd like to to this point. This exhibit will be here during the month of February, so I encourage your friends to come. The museum is free to all students in Thomas County. We certainly want them to come by and observe this rich history. Uh, our admission fee for the uh, adult population is $4, so please come by and visit the museum and the uh, out out outhousing structures that we have. Uh, this is your museum, Thomas County and Thomasville's museum. And we hope that you and your friends will come by to, to, to enjoy it. Uh, we have taped, of course, this afternoon's activities. We also have tapes of each oral history that was taken by the 15 individuals that are here today. Uh, these are available at cost if you would like a copy. Uh, we will have forms on this table after the meeting. If you would like to come by and sign your name and telephone number and which tape you want, uh, Jack Handy will be back in touch with you, and, uh, and as soon as uh, we get the tapes prepared, uh, we can provide them to you. The tape of today's activities, as well as each individual tape that you would like of the individuals who uh, gave us an oral history. Uh, the Georgia Humanities Council asks us as an organization to, to do an extensive evaluation 
of the impact of the good and the bad of this project, and they ask that the audience participate in this evaluation. Uh, because of the large numbers of people here, we chose not to ask you to fill out a questionnaire today, but several of you will be receiving a questionnaire in the mail in the next few days, and we appreciate it if you would put it in the self-addressed envelope, <coughs> respond to it, and send it back to us for that evaluation purpose. I think that finishes today's activity. Thank you once again for coming, and good night.